Send it to the internet! Hello. Hello! Welcome to Are You Karate Kidding Me? Your source for Cobra Kai and Karate Kid analysis, recaps, and items of interest from all around the Miyagi-verse. Yes, we are two nerds who can't stop talking about the Miyagi-verse. I'm Jenny Carlson. And I'm Colin Canaday. And we are here to bring you our recap and analysis of Season 2, Episode 1, Mercy, Part 2. Just to make sure everybody's caught up, last week we did our Season 2 spoiler cast, essentially, where we talked about our big feelings for Season 2. The overall opinion was a big thumbs up from both of us, I think. Yeah, it was heavy and, and much more intense, but uh, very well done in the spirit of what we've seen so far. I, I enjoyed it, and I'm looking forward to a deep dive. You know, speaking of, we're now going to reset the table and pretend like we haven't seen all of season two and talk about these episodes <laughs> individually on their own merit so that if, if somebody happens to be listening in the future and following along episode by episode, you know, our policy is not to spoil things chronologically. However, we will say that the season has been so well received that YouTube has already ordered a third season. We have an actual news item <laughs> today, which is as we're recording this, <laughs> the day we're recording this, YouTube announced that Cobra Kai has been renewed for season three, uh, which is super great news because, uh, uh, again, not to get too much into it, but, you know, season two continues the story from season one and leaves a lot of things hanging for season three. So it'll be nice to get that resolved one way or the other yeah and also i think that the show season two had 20 million views in its first week or something completely bonkers um yeah so it's obvious there is strong demand for yes. season three as soon as possible i assume that the showrunners and the writers are locked away right now working mm -hmm. on it and not listening to this right you guys are working right yeah thought so in addition to that, uh, I mean, the thing is that Cobra Kai continues to perform excellently as always. But my problem when I always talk to my friends about Cobra Kai, even people who love the Karate Kid movies, everybody I recommend this show to, uh, they are always like, ah, oh, but I got to pay for YouTube Premium. And I'm like, one, paying for YouTube Premium gets rid of all the ads, which is, that alone is enough of a bonus. Um, but two, you get... Cobra Kai, and now three, good news, as part of the season three announcement, they announced that later this summer, all episodes of Cobra Kai are going to go out to the YouTube audience in general. They're going to be subsidized with ads, like you would, you know, normally watch a YouTube video. Now it will be available to everyone. So now there's no longer any excuse anybody can get on YouTube and watch Cobra Kai starting this summer. That's right. So since you're listening to us, you've already watched Cobra Kai, but be sure and get out there and tell people you know they have mm -hmm. no excuse. Absolutely. And Pre I'm sure preach that... Preach that good news. Yeah. Well, I'm <laughs> sure once that happens, they'll probably do another big promotional push, and they'll probably double or even triple those already extremely high viewing numbers. Yes. So that news item out of the way, let's go ahead and dust our hands off and jump right into the episode, shall we? That's right. Here we go with Season 2, Episode 1, Mercy Part 2. We begin back at the dojo. We begin exactly where we left off in Season 1, which is Kreese coming in to threaten Johnny. Uh, Johnny actually calls out for Miguel when he hears the doorbell. He's got moral clarity about what happened at the tournament, and he wants to set Miguel straight and explain that fighting dirty is not the right thing to do. But it's not Miguel at the door. It's John Kreese, his evil sensei, back with a cigar, some turquoise jewelry, and a winning smile. Yeah, Kreese is back, and he delivers the same monologue as the end of season one, which is which ends with the real story's only just begun. Wow. Isn't that the truth? He explains that he's been away for a long time. You know, Johnny's like, I thought you were dead. And he's like, you ain't the only one. And and then we get a nice call back where he says to Johnny, still got that same that hot temper. Huh? And then he goes, but I like that. I like that. Which is the same thing that he said to Mr. Miyagi back in The Karate Kid. You're a pushy little bastard, ain't you? But I like that. 
I like that. If there was any doubt that this is not the real Crease or a clone or a or an evil twin, that, that should seal it for you. He also mentions that that, that hot temper must be how Johnny, you know, was enough of a hard ass to make M- Miguel the champion. So he knows about Miguel. That's why he's back. And he, I think he reaches for Johnny, and Johnny blocks him. Johnny's not taking it. Johnny kicks the cigar out of his mouth. I remember when we saw this at the premiere screening, people freaked out at that shot. Oh, and then yeah. they're into it. They're fighting, man. Like, they're all over the dojo, kicking each other's ass, blocking, kicking, punching. And I'm sure that there's a stunt, a stunt performer I can maybe catch sight of him. But, like, by and large, this is Martin Cove. Uh, going up against Billy Zabka, and it's it's spectacular. You know, when we all watched the end of season one, we could not wait to see what the next thing to happen would be. This is the last thing I probably expected to happen was a full-out Kreese versus Johnny fight. Like, Johnny's literally pulling no punches here. Kreese kicks Johnny into the mirror, and Johnny does pause to say, you know, you taught me to fight dirty, you broke my second place trophy, and you tried to kill me, and Kreese denies it. You know, meanwhile, the cigar that Johnny kicked out of Crease's mouth, has helpfully flown into a garbage can that it's starting to set on fire. Johnny's got Crease. He's wailing on him. He gets him in a chokehold. But in that moment, he sees their reflection in the broken glass that he'd just flown into himself and thinks about Crease choking him in the parking lot of the All Valley Tournament in 1984. Johnny goes into one of his classic fugue states, but this one's kind of very artfully done as we see it kind of composited into the broken mirror like you would see in like an 80s movie kind of that style it's a really yeah. cool stylish shot and i think it really serves to underscore the effect there so yeah and when johnny's got crease in that chokehold he realizes he doesn't want to be crease he lets go and crease goes showing mercy to an old man it's very honorable and then of course he drops johnny it's stupid again they're mm-hmm. there because Chris wants to talk to Johnny, and he's not letting go, though, without dominating him first. And so it sets off the fire alarm, and we go to our title card. All that before the credits. But we'll have to learn what comes of that fight later, because we've got to go over to the brand new Miyagi-Do. We've got Daniel and Robbie pulling the tarp off Daniel's old 1948 Ford convertible that Mr. Miyagi gave him. Mm -hmm. And already, Robbie anticipates that a can of wax is in his future, but Daniel's got other ideas like setting up all the stuff that used to be there when he was training, like the punching bag, having Robbie fix the fence with the nailing trick he learned in the Karate Kid Part 2. That's a great little Easter egg. Yeah, Robbie has to do it all one-handed as well because he's still got his arm in a sling from the tournament incident at the end of season one is that gonna cause some asymmetry when oh well i'm not even gonna worry about it they've also they're pulling all the tarps i know we just have to suspend disbelief there they're pulling the tarps off the cars you can see that mr miyagi's truck is also still there meanwhile robbie's right arm it's like he's got the infinity gauntlet on or something with all six stones i could simply snap my fingers they would all cease to exist and i call that mercy he's like out there doing the good work now he's waxing, and, and Colin, you caught this when we were watching it, like his arm is slowly healing oh, as yeah. the montage continues. Like Karate Kid and many classic 80s movies, there's nothing you can't solve with a good montage, and this is a good montage. There's a there's a round, like, pier thing that I don't remember from the movies. It's in the middle of the koi pond, and Daniel and Robbie wade out into the water to put two equally weighted bonsai trees on either side. So it's a little little opening metaphor for balance. They set up Mr. Miyagi's balance pool, like all good screenwriting tricks. If you think that's not coming back later, then you clearly have not been paying attention. And when they're done, Daniel and Robbie step outside of the room that Mr. Miyagi built on for Daniel. They open up those sliding doors and look out. And man, it really does look like the original set, even though I know that they had to rebuild it in Atlanta. Like, I believe I'm there. Meanwhile, at the LaRusso Mans, we've got... Uh, Amanda preparing dinner. It looks like she's cutting tomatoes for a salad. We got Anthony playing one of his gaming thing. Wh- which thing? Which gaming thing is he playing, Colin? Uh, well, Anthony's upgraded to the Nintendo Switch for this season. The Vito's oh. starting to show its age, I'm sure. Daniel's all excited because he's gotten his hands dirty again, and he's like, "What's up here?" He's feeling good, and Amanda explains that that Sam is still is in a room. She's still pretty upset about breaking up with Miguel, and Daniel's smug about that because. You know, Miguel is Cobra Kai's top bully, and he didn't want Sam dating him anyway. And Daniel also tries to persuade Anthony to do karate, but Anthony's wise. He knows that Daniel's version of karate is mostly chores. Yeah, but Daniel insists that the chores are 
part of it. Thanks, David Pumpkins. I'm David Pumpkins, man! And the skeletons are... And besides, Anthony has computer camp before him. That's right. He has a whole summer of computer camp. So enjoy Anthony while we can, because we probably won't see him for a little bit. Amanda has doubts about Daniel's ability to juggle all the responsibilities of the dealerships, you know, their life and the dojo. But Daniel insists that (laughs) balance is my thing. Uh, You know, the minute you say that balance is your thing, you're going to lose your balance. Why is he so smug, right? And Amanda's like, why does it have to be you? And he's like, I did it 30 years ago. Which is ridiculous. It's like he's 18 again. And I can do it again. Courtney Hengler, once again, taking her MVP role as the common sense bringer to Cobra Kai. The reality effect personified. Courtney Hengler. You're the real MVP. We'll have to come back to that later because we've got to go over to Johnny's apartment where Carmen has arrived. Johnny's sitting at his house. I don't know if he's watching Iron Eagle, but he's watching something. Mm -hmm. He's got his hand in a bucket of ice when he hears knocking on the door. And this is a measure of how few close relationships Johnny has. He anticipates that it's Crease knocking on the door, even though it's far too polite a knock. And indeed, no, it's Carmen. She congratulates him and is holding a tray of something that looks delicious. Turns out it's tres leches, which Johnny Better tells than the milk us. I used to drink. It's a clumsy line, but it works because Carmen's clearly into him. But what Carmen is also clearly into is Miguel's safety and well-being, which she has some pretty understandable concerns about. You know, she says, I noticed during the tournament that he had, you know, she tries to think of a euphemism for it, like a game face because Miguel was so angry. She's like, that's not anything but just his game face, right? Don't and Johnny's worry. like, Miguel's a good kid. I won't let him go astray. Like the minute that he said, don't worry, I was like, oh man, this is going to be so rough. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, Chekhov's foreshadowing going on in this episode. We're dropping a lot of things that are going to get picked up later in the season, but that's a pretty weighted line and, and hard to ignore. They also flash back to the tournament just to illustrate like the show uses a lot of flashbacks which is actually cool because it builds up this image consistency of flashing back to the original movies and now flashing back to the previous season and while they're sitting there talking and he's assuring carmen the phone rings of course now that his guards down it's crease reaching out smitty's diner 8 a.m and then hangs up the phone so even though we had a brief respite from Worrying about Crease, he's never too far away. And speaking of not far away. So yeah, now we head back to the LaRusso manse where we see Sam sitting in her room looking at her Instagram feed. Yeah, she's a little forlorn here, right? She's looking at all the pictures uh, that she took with Miguel that they took and posted together. And she's making the hard decision to block him. She straight up blocks him which isn't going to go great. But then, of course, Aisha's live feed shows up the very next thing where the Cobra Kai crew are at some sort of restaurant celebrating. The product tie-in is very strong as Aisha posts an Instagram story from whatever restaurant the Cobras go to celebrate at, and they're all having celebratory nachos. Uh, The Cobras, Moon, as well as Dimitri, who at this point is getting to be an honorary Cobra. But unfortunately... While Aisha's talking, she jokes that they the wait staff wouldn't take Hawk's fake ID, and Hawk is nervous because she has said this on a feed that his parents watch. So yeah. you can, it's, I like this scene because they're going back and forth with Dimitri and Eli. Dimitri trying to appeal to his relationship with Hawk before he became Hawk, and the whole time that this is happening, and Hawk wants Dimitri to shut up, you can see that Hawk is nervously looking over at Moon to make sure that she's still interested in him, even though he's actually Eli. Demetrius psyched about the Cobra Kai's big win. He's also psyched about embarrassing Hawk, unintentionally or not. Um, But Miguel is bummed because he immediately sees that Sam's blocked him on Insta. However, Aisha is there for Miguel. Yeah, Aisha's got good advice and is just trying to be a solid friend, but Hawk's got nothing but swagger for Miguel and like advises him to counterpunch. Maybe don't actually hit it this time. (laughs) You know, find another babe or what something. And Miguel is, is legit bummed out. Like, he knows he screwed up and there's nothing else he can do. And it's, it's you know, for them, it just happened the same day, right? We've been waiting a year to see these scenes. Now we cut to the next morning, 8.30 a.m. at whatever diner this is, Smitty's Diner, with a lovely oldie playing in the background. And Johnny walks in and sees Crease at a booth by the front window. Crease has been there for a minute and is eager to talk to Johnny and eager to sexually harass the waitress. Just like you, Dollface. 
He also wants to take a metaphor about brumation for a walk around the block and try it out on Johnny. Kreese wants to explain that he's been brumating like all cobras, which is sort of like hibernation, but for vipers. First, he explains that... Spend some time down there in 89, helping the Delta boys get that son of a bitch, Noriega. Right. Well, he wants to brag about all the time he's spent in the military he re-enlisted apparently after karate kid three and so he says yeah well so he says well i mean he wants to do i I don't know what the opposite of humble bragging is i guess it's just bragging crease is now leaning into his brumation metaphor explaining about how snakes stay underground all winter waiting for the right moment to emerge and he says that moment is now yes because it's time for an all-out war on millennials apparently yeah he basically says that Our society has gotten weak. It's like a page out of the book, The Coddling of the American Mind or whatever. And he wants to take kids today. Stop the ass kissing and start the ass kicking. And he's trying this gaslighting out on Johnny, but thankfully, you know, Johnny has wisened up a bit since uh, his high school days, and it's not really working. Get trophies just for showing up. It's funny because Kreese is saying some of the same things back to Johnny that Johnny seemed like he might have felt last season. Mm-hmm. But now that Johnny's actually engaging with students and understands that they're all different and you can't just, you know, break people down into cowards and brave people or badass people and nerds, even though Johnny doesn't have the words for it, that's what he sees. Once he realizes that Kreese is interested in teaching his students, Johnny's like, Stay the hell away from my students, you understand? And Johnny's like, you ruined my life. And Kreese refused to believe it. And then, of course, being You Kreese had no says, life before you met me. Because we got to keep that gas lighting up if we're going to get our target. Exactly. Johnny also The world may need Cobra Kai, but we don't need you. This attempt does not work, so maybe Kreese will have to try again. We'll find out later, because now we have to head back over to Miyagi-Do, where Daniel is <laughs> delivering some flashbacks to Robbie. So Daniel is here getting high on his own supply of nostalgia and gives Robbie a... (laughs) Yeah. He's not the only one. Right. And he gives Robbie a download of the rules of Miyagi-Go straight from Karate Kid 2. Robbie looks down on a box of stuff and pulls out what looks like the drum, the hand drum from the Karate Kid Part 2. And the audience in the premiere went bonkers when that happened. Careful. That drum saved my life. Man, when I was a little kid, I had one of those drum toys, and to see it in a scene with Ralph Macchio again, like, freaked me out. Anyway, so we get schooled in key totems of the Miyagi-verse, like Mr. Miyagi's Medal of Honor. Uh, Robbie didn't know that Mr. Miyagi was a war hero, and Robbie's like... it wasn't all bonsais and kata. Bonsai tree. Robbie's beginning to understand not everything is as seems, right? And so he points to the scrolls that explain the rules of Miyagi-Do Karate, like... Karate for defense only. Literally translated, empty hand. And then the other rule... Fast run rule number one. So we get a nice flashback to Mr. Miyagi explaining those to Daniel in Okinawa in the Karate Kid Part 2. It's so neat to see the Karate Kid Part 2 come in. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just, it's super exciting because that... When I was little, I really loved that Karate Kid. Robbie is feeling it. However, he does admit that when his dad finds out what they're up to, he won't know what hit him. And Daniel looks a little conflicted about that. Robbie's excited about it, and Daniel is, has pause. Robbie's taken on the rivalry a little bit from Daniel. It's a little aggro for Miyagi Do. That's true. Now we cut to Cobra Kai Dojo at the strip mall, and Hawk and Miguel are rolling up on scooters that may or may not be like lift scooters that, and lime scooters that we see all around Austin. Yeah, Hawk and Miggy have rolled up and they take the opportunity to roast some of the fresh fish that have shown up to take Cobra Kai classes. There's a cluster of potential new students, including two new guys who are clearly going to become more central to the plot. And Hawk basically wants to haze them and Miguel is being a little nicer about it. The kids also notice that the dojo is trashed. However, Johnny is more upset about the performance at the tournament, specifically Hawk and Miguel's willingness to throw their opponents under the bus at the first opportunity. Johnny's so upset about it that he kicks all the new interested students out so that he can dress his quiver down and let them know who's boss. Mm-hmm. Has them fall in and then instantly gets into asking them questions. Johnny clearly has a book of animal Mad Libs in his office because he takes the opportunity to 
create a parable about snakes One in the jungle. One kills the strongest lion. The other kills a crippled monkey. He asks Aisha, which one is the more honorable cobra? And of course, Aisha answers. The one that kills answers, a lion, Sensei. And why is that? Because it killed a stronger animal. You know, as he's doing this and asking these questions, he's brought Hawk and Miguel up to the front of the room. And he's already asked them if they, you know, hurt an opponent when his back was turned, if they targeted the opponent's injury. And so Hawk and Miguel know that they're in trouble, even though they were on paper the most successful Cobras at the tournament. And Johnny's appealing to badassery again, right? Like uh, the baddest badass, he says, is the one who beats his opponent when at, its, at his strongest. So Johnny is you know, yelling at Hawk and Miguel about hurting an opponent at their weakest and he says means no more cheating no more fighting dirty so now we see that badassery means something more complicated to johnny although he still says that cheating is what he calls a pussy move right so either you're badass in johnny's universe or you're a pussy so he also tells everyone that they've been downgraded to white belts yeah he wants everybody to start over he's desperately trying to reconcile his honor ethos with the ethos of Cobra Kai's No Mercy, and it's it's a divide that I think is going to drive this entire season. Aisha gets to warm everybody up because Hawk and Miguel have to give 50 push-ups on their knuckles, but Miguel is unsatisfied with what just happened and goes into the office to talk to Johnny about I'm it. I'm teaching and you Johnny's a lesson. Like, yeah, well, what about Miguel's No Mercy? Like, you taught us to win at all costs. Well, maybe Johnny I'm still says, learning a bit, too. And Miguel still isn't good I with it. I understand you have no like, problem with us attacking anyone else. Why take pity on Robbie Keane? Miguel, being as smart as he is, goes right to the heart of the situation. We complain about a lot of shows where the characters either don't know enough or they don't know key things that are going on, but Miguel is on it. He's like, it's really weird that this new honor ethic showed up the minute we started to wail on Robbie Keane. Is there some connection to Robbie Keane I don't know about? At this point, Johnny says... the difference between mercy and honor, and I paid the price for it. If I'm extra hard on you... It's only because you have the potential to be better than I ever was. You want that, don't you? That brings them back to a connection, and they bow, and it's okay. But, like, uh, it's just interesting because I really thought that the arc of this season was going to be, like, the dark side Miguel, and that Miguel would go full-on evil because he was such a rage monster at the tournament. But they've pulled back on that, and I think that's smart because just because someone is going down an angry path doesn't mean they go whole hog right away. And it makes sense that a character as smart as Miguel would be that thoughtful and would would take pause because of his own failures with Sam, right? Yeah. Speaking of Sam, as we exit the dojo with Aisha, we see that Sam has rolled up to say hi. Sam's there in her car waiting just in case Aisha has time to hang out. It's amazing that Sam even went by the dojo given how awkward it is between her and Miguel right now. And awkward between her and Cobra Kai in general. Yeah, I mean, her dad might have a heart attack if he saw her sitting outside the dojo. True. She asked Aisha to join her, but Aisha can't because she and the guys are going to watch a movie called Over the, the Top. The has always bet against Lincoln Hawks, but a winner never listens to the odds. That Johnny Lawrence recommended to them to watch. is required viewing, actually, so they could discuss it the next day. Aisha wants Sam to join them, but Sam just isn't up for that yet. So they'll have to try to see each other some other time, which is going to be increasingly difficult given how much of Aisha's life is taken up with Cobra Kai. And unfortunately, we do not get a scene of the Cobras watching over the top because we have more important business. We've got to head over to the building supply store. Indeed. It's like Home Depot, but with yellow vests. The only difference between home supply stores at this point are the vests, for sure. This is also our first appearance of Raymond, as played by Paul Walter Hauser. You may recognize him from such movies as I, Tanya, which he was pretty great in that. And uh, yeah, he kind of serves a similar purpose here as well. Yeah, he's also in Black Klansman. Oh, that's right. So he's uh, got one of those yellow vests on. He's standing in the aisle. Johnny's come to the building supply store to try and replace his mirror uh, after the fight with Kreese. And so Raymond is there. Johnny's come up to him for assistance. And Raymond is super excited because Johnny's wearing a Metallica shirt. And even though Raymond clearly was barely born in the 80s. Yeah, in the 80s that, were the like, best era ever. Right? Remember so Caddyshack? Like, you remember the gopher? He used to dance? The... And Johnny's guy, I don't like, know. I was partying with babes back then. <laughs> He's just a little too into 80s stuff, maybe because he he starts talking about the uh, the gopher from Caddyshack. Uh, oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Maybe because he looks a little bit like the gopher from Caddyshack uh, in his outfit. Oh, I can't unsee that now. <laughs> he does look like the gopher from Caddyshack. The Zen philosopher Basho once wrote, a flute with no holes is not a flute, and a donut with no hole 
He's a Danish. He's a funny guy. And that's where I dropped the Caddyshack drop. Thank you very much. I didn't even remember the Caddyshack gopher until that moment. You know, it's all in good fun. That is until we see that Daniel and Robbie are also at the building supply store. Raymond has gone off to find what Johnny needs, but Johnny sees through the shelving across the way that Daniel and Robbie are there in the screws and bolts. And Daniel's like, we need a toggle bolt. And Robbie's like, well, that's not as big. He's got a little secret. See this spring? And Daniel shows him how the bolt expands when it goes into the wall to support the wood. And Robbie, of course, being a Miyagi-Do student, thinks it's a You're metaphor. That in life, says, I can't do everything by myself and I have to rely on other people. Yeah, Robbie's desperately trying to fish a metaphor out of this. And Daniel's but just If you can like, bring a Robbie, metaphor out of that, you're a better student than I ever was. <laughs> I'm, I'm just here to, to do some home, home repairs. This is like Miyagi-Do at its happiest and cheesiest, which Johnny is seeing and, and left to feel very awkward and inadequate. And at this moment, Raymond comes back up to Johnny and everyone sees each other and Daniel realizes that Johnny's been watching them this whole time. And Raymond, being that guy, instantly begins imitating the LaRusso auto chop ads, making Daniel feel awkward. He also mentions that he always wanted to do karate, but his mom wouldn't let him. And then he claims that... Just like him, is this your son? So Raymond is there to put not just one foot, but all of his extremities in his mouth at the same time. That'll probably be it for Raymond for now. But what happens out of this incredibly awkward encounter is very interesting. Daniel kind of uh, understands that Robbie needs a minute, and so he grabs his gear and buzzes off to the register, leaving just Robbie and Johnny to have a moment. And the moment they have is very interesting. Robbie's clearly very angry at Johnny. And he's got angry eyes. And Johnny looks really wounded and sad. And That's Johnny's so like... Getting better. Robbie's like, no thanks to you. Ooh. You know, he's like, you had Diaz fight dirty with me. I didn't tell me like, I would fight dirty against you. Even though Robbie's angry, Johnny's like... I don't want there to be like, blood between us. It's like, Johnny really is emotionally honest to Robbie, is patient with Robbie, and, and Robbie's like... I forgive you or whatever, but right now, it's a little tough. Robbie's trying to be reasonable, but Johnny is mad all the same, so he takes it on Daniel by referring to Daniel as a prick. That pisses Robbie off. Johnny poked the bear, so Robbie says, don't talk about Mr. LaRusso that way. He's a better man than you'll ever be. Luke Skywalker telling Han Solo that Ben Kenobi's a great man, only with an added twist of... You suck too. And by the way, you're my dad and I hate you. So Robbie goes outside of the building supply store mm-hmm. and there is Daniel loading stuff in the trunk and Daniel's like, how'd it go? There's and Robbie's like, rivalry with you than he does about me. Which really isn't true, but the only thing Robbie was able to hear in that moment was Johnny's anger toward Daniel. Johnny may be apologetic, but it's kind of this opposite of the situation that he has with Daniel where like he thinks that you know Daniel hung the moon and that everything he says is you know some sort of dripping with double meaning and he's so hung up on Daniel in a way that when Johnny tries to make some sort of olive branch Robbie's just not there yeah but you know who is there Sam Sam LaRusso is back at the LaRusso manse working out in the dojo She's in the home dojo. She's clearly been been working on her aggression solo without anyone watching her, or so she thinks, because Daniel walks up and is like, I had no idea you still came in here. Daniel wants to talk to Sam because she's still clearly wound up about Miguel. And so he dusts off the old, my first girlfriend talk. (laughs) He name checks Judy from Karate Kid 1, which is a nice touch. He's basically trying to connect with Sam about her breakup with Miguel by giving her the story of, well, if it didn't work out with this one, it will work out with the next one. And he she was explains in another league. And so that's Judy. The second girl he dated was in another, another league. And this foreshadows Allie. It's so interesting to juxtapose this. because he's a story says, for another time. And then there's a story after that one and that one. <laughs> he also says that Allie was true love, right? He distinguishes that between Judy and Allie that... But it's so interesting to juxtapose this with how Johnny talked about Allie mm-hmm. in the previous season when Johnny was telling Miguel, right? Yeah, I hit like on Johnny her a few like, times so she gave me a chance. Went to golf and stuff for our first date. We were madly in love. Johnny had a story and Daniel was the culprit of the demise of his relationship with Allie. You know, notwithstanding the fact that they were already broken up, that they'd had problems, there was a boundary there. Whereas with Daniel, it's just like these things happen. You know, it was true love, but then it wasn't. And that's just the way it goes. And you know, that's... 
Not the only thing, Sam is also distressed over the rise of Cobra Kai and how it, it seems that, uh, that Cobra Kai's popularity is kind of worming its way through all the student population at school. She and refers to it as a cult that's brainwashing half the school. And Daniel thinks he has well, all the That's why I'm opening up Miyagi-Do, so we can fight back, take down Cobra Kai. I don't want to fight like, them. They're not my enemies, they're my friends. And Daniel gets that look on his face that he got last season when Amanda was like, you know, what the hell's wrong with you? He's like, oh no, you know, this is true. Like, I've been doing something that's counter the principles of Miyagi-Do wanting to fight. So Sam walks out and he's left with food for thought. Speaking of thoughts, our next scene actually takes place inside Johnny's head. A lot has come out of this one broken mirror, right? Johnny's back at the dojo. He's reinstalling the mirror, replacing the mirror that they broke in his fight with Kreese. Yeah. While he's doing it, he flashes back. We see Owen B. Stone is playing young Johnny, standing there. From the back, we see Crease. They're standing in front of the picture of Crease's special forces picture. Young Johnny's crying, and he's like explaining that his stepdad had done something, and Crease has no time. The for moment him. those like, tears leave your eyes, you lose. And I don't have time for losers. They're doing a little call and response, which ends with young Johnny. A little terrifying. Johnny's just trying to keep the only father that he now has, which is Kreese, right? Because he knows that his stepdad is pointless and mean and doesn't give him any attention and he doesn't have his biological father. So he'll do what he can to keep Kreese. And we see that, that present day Johnny looks pretty rattled by that memory. So cut to Mr. Miyagi's residence, which is now Miyagi-Do Karate. And Robbie is doing the nail trick from Karate Kid Part 2 with some satisfaction as he affixes the official Miyagi-Do karate sign to the fence that he and Daniel just repaired. As he walks back up to the house, we see through the rice paper windows of the sliding doors, Daniel doing a meditation, a breathing meditation. You know, Robbie's apologetic for interrupting him, and Daniel explains when Robbie's like, that doesn't look like kata that this is a, a form of meditation that mr miyagi taught him for whenever he loses focus and of course this reminds me of the karate kid part three right which in a bit of a clunky plot but all the same mr miyagi teaches daniel to gain focus and in this way he can defeat mike barnes the bad boy of karate. The, Cobra Kai, the challenger mike barnes and you you can dream about me Karate's bad boy, Mike Barnes. So we see a little bit of Karate Kid 3 alongside Karate Kid 2. Yeah, Daniel is meditating, and and when Robbie asks him what's up, he admits Ever since the that, tournament, all I've been thinking about are ways to destroy Cobra Kai. But he realizes after his talk with Sam... Cobra Kai that, is the enemy. There are no enemies. Your dad, his students... They're just like you and me. Uh, and so inspired by Sam, uh, Daniel's plan is to go pacifist aggressive. Now that Daniel is planning not to fight Cobra Kai, but to show them a better way by not fighting them, by just building up Miyagi-Do and, and not acting like they're any enemies, Daniel's perspective is Johnny, his students, they're not bad. They just had bad teachers. Which is very true. and They need to be shown a different way, a better way. The good news of karate, you might say. That's right. And then from off screen, we hear Sam in tone. Yeah, room for one more? Magically, as soon as Daniel knew that they weren't going to fight, Sam showed up. That's right. And of course, there's a little joke about how there are plenty of chores left for Sam, even though they've already set up. And Daniel's excited because they've not even been open a day and he's doubled his roster. And speaking of karate schools with huge rosters, we've got to go back over to Cobra Kai one more time this episode and check in on Johnny. Johnny is putting up everything that he had had out to work on that mirror. He's got his paint can, his tools, and here's the door open and close one more time. And you can tell from the look on his face who's there even before the camera cuts to John Kreese, now no longer wearing a black gangster suit, wool coat, but instead he's wearing something that looks like military fatigues or army surplus, mm -hmm. holding a big duffel bag. And he I says realized that, that I was too hard on you. You were young and I went overboard. Chris has now tried, he's tried fighting Johnny, he's tried getting on Johnny's side, and now he's going for the pathos move. He's, uh, he wants a shot at redemption, and he understands if Johnny doesn't want him back, but 
he did fix up Johnny's second place trophy. Yeah, Chris tries to talk about how Johnny had seen what he'd seen, he'd understand, but that doesn't change what he did. And so, you know, he's often thought that he could take back that night when he attacked Johnny if he could, but he's thought a lot about it I since mean, then. And I'd like more in this world than to have another chance. I understand yeah, he says, if you never want to see me again. But just remember, I am the guy who always rooted for you. I mean, I guess PolitiFact true, on, uh, you know, on that one. Yeah, uh, so then he's like... I almost forgot. And then he pulls up the duffel bag, and there we have a trophy that has Johnny's name on it, 1984, second place. I he it says, for you. Now, I really thought that Johnny still had that trophy, but maybe not. Maybe Kreese really kept it, or maybe Kreese just had a new one made. I don't trust John Kreese. And Johnny looks at it. You can tell that Johnny's visibly moved. And Kreese says... Say second place. But in my opinion, you were always the better fighter. That's and man, right. Martin Cove, Marty Cove sells this so well, right? Oh, he's the best. He gives a little, he gives a little wink, says, see a kid. And Johnny's visibly moved as Kreese walks out the door with his now much lighter duffel bag. And he walks very slowly with a sort of determined expression on his face, out, looking kind of tired, and then boom, the door opens and Johnny says, hold up. Kreese is strangely submissive in this moment, speaking of not trusting him. And it's because it was, you know, like a snake. He was manipulating Johnny all along, building up a false sense of security. I was really like, oh my God, this has to be a Kreese redemption arc. This is amazing. I can't believe the show's going to pull it off. And then the minute Johnny says, hold up, uh, we see a little twist on Martin Cove's lips. And yet I think to myself, I think Kreese is not just here to redeem himself. Not in the way that we might think. And that concludes Mercy Part 2. Ah, another one in the bag. Another one in the bag. And the first one of the new year, uh, the new year of Cobra Kai, that is, the year of the Cobra. And I think this is fantastic. I had a lot of fun. I can't believe that they took the show in the direction that they did where, I mean, I'm not surprised to see John Kreese, but I'm really excited to see where they go from here because they've set up some interesting pieces on the board. Colin, what did you think of this episode? Watching that final scene with Kreese and, and Johnny, the thought that popped into my head was just never count out those character actors. Traditionally, Character actors are classified as, you know, kind of sidekicks or villains or, you know, things like that. And I think that really doesn't do them justice necessarily. Like, Kreese is, Martin Cove is kind of one of those classic old school actors. And there's a story, like, in every gesture, in every, like, facial twitch, right? He's putting a lot of subtext and a lot of nuance into what he's doing to to sell you this character and it works because you know as you said so many times before when you know when we were talking about the the other movies or season one is that crease was a terrifying figure you know kind of overshadowing karate kids one two and three because of that you know it's kind of an uphill battle reintroducing him and trying to give him some pathos trying to give him some kind of redemption or at least giving us the hint that he might be looking for some kind of redemption like that's a hard turn to make but because cove is such a veteran and such a great actor in general like he's doing the same thing that william zobka has been showing us the whole series long is that you know you can take these characters that didn't have a lot of screen time in the earlier movies and show us a lot about what makes them tick and where they have to go as characters. I mean, the thing about, well, I'll say, you know, first about Martin Cove, not, he wasn't just on, you know, the hardcore stuff like you know, Karate Kid and Rambo where he played, he played a heavy, you know, he's a character actor, but he's also anchored shows like Cagney and Lacey forever. He even, I think for a season had his own show, like yeah. Hard Time on Planet Earth, like in the late 80s. Like he's, 
he's done all kinds of different work. So he has so much more range than people's imagination of Crease <laughs> might allow for. And he's really bringing that here. He's humanizing Crease, but for a different end than Billy Zabka is humanizing Johnny. Right. Right. Like they're fleshing out these characters for this world. I expected Johnny to be far more submissive to Crease out of fear than he was you know like you said the fight was so unexpectedly over the top at the very beginning it's interesting to see johnny fight back and then take pause and i remember talking to billy zabka at the premiere and he was like i was really worried about this that people would have a problem with johnny taking crease back of course by the end of the episode johnny's ready to take crease back robbie has been so mean to johnny and johnny wants there to have a second chance with robbie so of course he would be willing to give crease a second chance the minute crease shows him the mercy that he's trying to show Robbie, of course he'll be open to that. I totally bought it, and I loved how they did that. That's probably my favorite element of this first episode of season two. That said, I, there's a lot of other strong stuff here, right? I'm so happy, like I already said, that Miguel isn't full-on, you know, Hayden Christensen, Anakin Skywalker turns Darth Vader. And, of course, you know, Hakka and Aisha are playing out the, the dual ways in which Cobra Kai hurts and helps. Like, Aisha's loyal... She's persistent in a certain way, but for Hawk, just strike back. It's interesting to see how now that they've had some success as Cobras, how that's being incorporated in playing against their personalities and their insecurities, especially in the case of Hawk. Mm -hmm. And as far as Miyagi-Do is concerned, man, I mean, so many feelings with all those Easter eggs and, and the clear love with which that whole world has been recreated, right? Yeah, I mean, that's what I was saying. People dismiss the term character actor but i don't think there's anything secondary about it you know i think that actors are actors and when people say character actors i think what they really mean is someone who can bring a lot to a little and then when you give them a lot to do they just go for the moon and, and it's pretty wonderful to watch cove really has a challenge here because Crease the character has done some really bad stuff. Mm -hmm. So the show has to hold him accountable for that to succeed, I think, in the moral universe that it's constructed. And Cove has to do a tightrope walk where he has to convey Crease's humanity, but not chew up the scenery so much that the show can't hold him accountable. And so that will be interesting to see how they navigate that. I also want to say big shout out to Mary Mauser, who's becoming a karate badass, it's obvious, and it's going to be really neat to see her and to talk about her doing karate over the season. Like, I'm really excited to see women coming into both dojos, but in the case of Sam, I'm excited because it doesn't just feel like destiny and she's the next karate kid, it feels like she's a kid who's figuring it all out and owning that and doing it very much as a kid would and there to do it for the right reasons, right? Both she and Robbie, even though Robbie's taking on the rivalry like they are, they're both coming to it out of genuine respect and excitement for Miyagi-Do. It's going to be exciting to see the build-up, what Miyagi-Do grows to be over the course of this season. I think it's going to be really fun to watch. Yeah, and I think it's also going to be hard to watch to a certain extent because, you know, Daniel's very precious about Miyagi-Do. Mm -hmm. But and you rightly can't be so. precious... Well, of course, but like you can't be precious all the time. Like they're going to have challenges. And right now he's very venerating of it all. And again, rightly so, but also he has to strike out and make his own legacy, right? He can't only think about Mr. Miyagi. So I think, you know, now that we have both in the, in the figure of John Kreese, but then also in the absent figure of Mr. Miyagi, these father figures that both Daniel and Johnny are going to have to come to terms with. It's not the, the father that they wish they had or the father they need to be right now. It's the father that that they did have and how they move beyond that legacy in this new way through karate. So I'm really curious how that will happen for Daniel, because with Johnny, it's, it's a little more obvious, right? Like we know that crease is probably toxic or there will be some toxicity there and these conflicting viewpoints about how to train kids and what, what this means yeah. with Daniel, the sheer gravitas of Mr. Miyagi and the kindness of Mr. Miyagi and the nonviolence of Mr. Miyagi is something that is not really Daniel's personality. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not to say that Daniel doesn't have a good personality. Daniel's a sweet and, and loyal person, I think. But, like, the thing is that he's still trying to be someone he's not. Right. So I'm really curious how that's going to play out going forward. I think that does it for our analysis on Cobra Kai 
the season two, episode one, Mercy Part Two. Yes, that is it. So here we are. We're doing it. We're digging into season two. Next week, we'll be back with our second recap of the season, which is season two, episode two, Back in Black. Oh, boy. Oh, boy, indeed. <laughs> but until then, I've been Colin Canada. I've been Jenny Carlson, and we'll see you around the Miyagi-verse. See you around the Miyagi-verse. This podcast has been produced and hosted by Colin Canada and Jenny Carlson. Our music is by Chepo. You can find us at Karate Kid Pod on Twitter. And wherever you download podcasts.